Hello, listeners. I'm your host, Amara, and this is Black Girl Gone, a true crime podcast. On this episode of Black Girl Gone, we tell the story of Lauren Smith Fields, a 23-year-old woman who was found dead in her apartment in Bridgeport, Connecticut on December 12, 2021. The night before Lauren was found, she had a date with a man that she met on Bumble. But when a day and a half went by and Lauren's family had not heard from her, they went over to her apartment to see if she was okay. But instead of finding Lauren, they found a note on her door with a phone number to call. Police made no attempt to contact Lauren's family to inform them of her death. And this, along with a number of other questionable actions on behalf of the police department, left Lauren's family demanding answers. What really happened to Lauren? And why did it take so long for her death to be investigated? This is Lauren's story. I know that a lot of you are familiar with the story of what happened to Lauren Smithfields. At the beginning of this year, Lauren's story was featured on multiple news outlets, and it was all over social media. Lauren's beautiful photos, coupled with the mysterious circumstances surrounding her death and the way in which her death was handled by the local police, made people intrigued and angry. It took six weeks before police began any kind of investigation into Lauren's death, and that was only after demands from her family and people on social media. In January of this year, the Bridgeport Police Department did announce that with the assistance from the DEA, they were going to open an investigation into Lauren's death, and they were looking to find out if foul play was involved. When the story first broke, many of you tagged me in the story, and a lot of podcasts and YouTubers covered Lauren's story. I felt like for me, it was better to wait until we received more information about what happened to Lauren. In the first few weeks after a story like this breaks, the pieces of the story usually move pretty fast, and so it's easier to get information wrong. But we are now approaching four months since Lauren died, and her family is still awaiting answers. And a lot of things surrounding how her case was handled have now come to the surface. But as I tell the story today, please keep in mind that this is an active investigation, there are still many moving pieces to this story and a ton of information that we are not privy to. We know police are reluctant to release information, especially in an active investigation. And so there will be information that we may not know and may be known to them if they are indeed conducting an investigation that they just have not released publicly. Lauren's story, however, deserves to be told over and over again until her family gets the answers that they deserve about what happened to her. I know her family doesn't want us to forget about her as they fight for justice and answers. Lauren's family, along with many people in the public, believe that had Lauren been white, the investigation into her death would have been handled completely differently. As the public and the media start to acknowledge the way in which cases involving people of color are handled differently, Many police departments still refuse to acknowledge that many times the families of these victims are critical of the way police handle the cases involving their loved ones. Lauren smith Fills was born in Bridgeport, Connecticut on January 23, 1998. She grew up the only girl amongst four siblings. While she grew up, her family moved between Bridgeport and Stamford. In high school, Lauren ran track at Stanford High School, and everyone close to Lauren said that she was a sweet girl who everybody loved. They described her as vibrant with a magnetic personality. It was clear from an early age that Lauren had a bright future ahead of her. You can probably tell by Lauren's photos that she was very much into hair and makeup because in every picture I've seen of her, they're both perfect. One of her brothers said in an interview with Essence Magazine earlier this year that, quote, she was multifaceted for sure, very funny, gave great advice. Even though she was my little sister, we could always go to her and talk and vent, and she would always give us great feedback. She would light up any room, any room that she was in. She always shined. Lauren was very active on social media also and had a YouTube channel where she shared beauty tutorials. 
Over the years, Lauren's stunning photos and tutorials on YouTube had gained her a pretty large following. Lauren had decided that she wanted to go to college, and so she enrolled at Norwalk Community College. Now, reports conflict about Lauren, what Lauren was majoring in, and some say it was cosmetology. But according to her obituary, Lauren was majoring in physical therapy. It had been something that she had wanted to do for a long time. Lauren also loved to travel, and she loved hanging out with her friends. A quick look at her Instagram page shows her on various vacations, from Puerto Rico to Rome. I mean, for a young woman from a very small state, she had made sure to see as much of the world as she could in her young life. By all accounts, Lauren was happy, a loving young woman who had the world at her feet. And she was more than just beautiful pictures. She had a beautiful life ahead of her, too. Lauren had even started her own business doing eyebrows, and she was using the money to help pay for her classes at Norwalk. She called her business Dual Eyebrows, and she did microblading, brow tinting, and shaping, as well as eyebrow threading, all of which have become very popular services over the last few years. And a lot of women have built really successful businesses providing these services. So in 2021, Lauren was living in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and she was taking classes and building her business and her brand. In the summer of 2021, according to her Instagram account, Lauren traveled to the Dominican Republic, and she shared photos and videos of her vacation and what appeared to be a very, very fun time. As the year wound down, Lauren had begun discussing plans for her 24th birthday and was planning to go to Greece to celebrate. Unfortunately, Lauren wouldn't make her trip to Greece, and she would never get to celebrate her 24th birthday. Now, as I begin to tell the story about what happened to Lauren the night she died, I need you to keep in mind that the details of what happened come mostly from the man that Lauren was with that night. So when you hear me say, he said, or according to him, that's why. As far as we know, there are no witnesses to what happened, and Lauren cannot tell her side. The investigation is ongoing, and police have not released any further details or accounts of what happened to Lauren. So if there are things that don't make sense, just remember that all we have right now is the initial police report. Now, Lauren, like a lot of people living in this era, used dating apps to meet people. The past two years, living under COVID restrictions and the inability to meet people while you're hanging out meant a lot of people had turned to technology in order to create human connections. Dating apps have become so popular that saying you met someone online isn't as taboo as it used to be. In fact, nowadays, it's fairly common for people to meet on apps like Tinder or Bumble. Now, I personally miss the dating app wave because I've been married for 11 years, so there are parts that I don't know about. But I do completely understand why people use them. Lauren was using a dating app called Bumble, and Bumble is similar to the more popular Tinder. It allows you to create a profile, and then you swipe left or swipe right from people you're interested in or not interested in. That's not clear how long Lauren had been using Bumble or whether or not she had been on any other dates that she had met on the app. But according to reporting, on December 8th, 2021, Lauren met a man named Matthew LaFountain on the app. Now, Matthew is a 37-year-old design engineer who also lived in Connecticut. It's not clear who made the initial contact or why they connected with each other, but Matthew said that after they met on Bumble, that they later found out that they had a mutual friend on Instagram, and so they began communicating on Instagram. Lauren and Matthew chatted over the next few days. However, their communications, according to Matthew, remained on Instagram. He said that Lauren never gave him her phone number. After chatting back and forth on Instagram, Lauren and Matthew made plans to see each other. Matthew said that Lauren invited him to come over to her apartment on Saturday, December the 11th. Matthew told detectives that before they met, that Lauren had texted him and asked him for $40 to get her nails done and asked him to bring a bottle of tequila with him when he came. Matthew arrived at Lauren's apartment around 9.30 p.m. on Saturday, according to him. He said he called her via Instagram since he still did not have her number. He said he called Lauren twice on Instagram, but she didn't answer. Now, thinking he may have been stood up, Matthew said that he decided to leave. He said not long after he left, though, Lauren called him back and told him to come back to the apartment. He said that she told him that she had not answered the phone because she was doing her makeup. 
And so Matthew went back to Lauren's apartment and he said that they began taking shots of the Casamigos tequila that he had brought with him. Matthew said that after a few shots, Lauren became ill. He said that she went to the bathroom where she threw up. And he said that after she threw up, she was really apologetic about being sick. He said they then decided to mix the tequila with like juice instead of just taking shots. Apparently, after throwing up, Lauren was fine because, according to Matthew, they continued to drink. They then ate, they played some games, and then decided to watch a movie. Now, Matthew said that Lauren had been texting with someone while they were watching the movie, and that Lauren said that her brother was coming by to drop something off to her. He said Lauren got up, and then she went outside. Now, her brother, Lakeem, is able to confirm at least part of this story, because He said he called his sister that night, but he wasn't dropping anything off to her. He was picking up a basket of clothing from her, something that Matthew never mentions. Lakeem also told Rolling Stone magazine that he had not texted his sister since the 4th of December. So it was not him that she was texting back and forth with. And Matthew never mentions a phone call. Now, Lakeem said that when he arrived, Lauren came outside and she made no mention of anyone being inside her apartment. He said that she appeared to be fine. She didn't look sick or drunk. Lakeem, being the older brother and someone who was very close to his sister, said that he most definitely would have noticed if she was high and or drunk. Lakeem said that he would have at least asked her what was going on. And she was outside with him for at least 10 to 15 minutes, which would have given him enough time to figure out if she was drunk. Lakeem said that when he last saw his sister, everything appeared to be fine. When Lauren returned to the apartment, according to Matthew, she went into the bathroom where she stayed for about 10 minutes. Now, Matthew said that he thought it was quote unquote odd that she was in the bathroom for so long, but that he didn't feel like it was his place to say anything because he didn't know Lauren that well. But after returning from the bathroom, Matthew said that they continued to watch movies and drink until Lauren fell asleep on the couch. Now, after falling asleep on the couch, Matthew said that he carried Lauren to her bedroom and placed her on her bed. He said he then laid down next to her and fell asleep. Matthew said that he woke up at around 3 a.m. to use the bathroom and that he could hear Lauren snoring. Three and a half hours later, Matthew said that he woke up and found Lauren laying on her side with blood coming from her nostril and she was not breathing. How did a date with a new man and a night of tequila drinking turn into Lauren unresponsive in her own bed the next morning? When Lauren's brother left her apartment that night, he didn't know it would be the last time that he saw his sister alive. He also didn't know the battle that he and his family would have to fight to get answers about what really happened to Lauren. Life is so much easier with a great sense of humor. No one ever said it had to be rated PG. Sometimes it feels good to let out your inner smartass and drop a few F-bombs. Smartass and Sass is a subscription box meant for the unashamed mouthy person. Get your fix of brazen humor each month. Smart Ass and Sass items are curated and personally tested by the SNS team, a group of really mouthy people who want you to get a good laugh in your day. SNS partners with some of the best small businesses to bring you trendy and snarky items each month. I really love the unique selection of things that are put in my box each month. The big box, which comes with a mouthy shirt and snarky items, is priced at $54.95. And each big box contains one SNS design t-shirt, has between seven to nine unique items, and is valued at over $90. And there are other subscription sizes available too. Subscribe at www.smartassandsass.com. Use code GIRLGONE for 10% off your first subscription order. Follow Smart Ass and Sass on social media for your daily dose of attitude. On Saturday, December 11, 2021, 23-year-old Lauren Smithfield spent the evening at her apartment with a man named Mouthy LaFountain. According to him, they met a few days earlier on Bumble. The two had connected on the app, and after finding out that they had a mutual friend on Instagram, struck up a conversation and spent the next three days messaging back and forth. According to Matthew, He had arrived at Lauren's home at 9.30 p.m. 
and the two spent the evening drinking tequila, playing games, and watching movies until Lauren fell asleep on the couch. But Matthew said the next morning when he woke up at 6.30 a.m., Lauren wasn't breathing and blood was coming from her nostril. Matthew told detectives that he had immediately called 911 after finding Lauren, but there's no information about the exact time the 911 call was placed. However, officers arrived on the scene shortly after 6.30 a.m. on December the 12th. And when officers arrived at the apartment, they knocked on the door and it was answered by Matthew, who police described in the incident report as frantic. The officer on the scene said that Matthew said that the 911 operator had told him to perform chest compressions on Lauren. Matthew led police to the back of the apartment where Lauren's bedroom was, and there the officers found Lauren unresponsive. Now, at this point, Matthew had moved Lauren, and so she was no longer on the bed. She was now lying on the floor. And according to the report, the 911 operator was still on the phone with Matthew when responding officers arrived. The officer said that Matthew picked up his phone and asked the 911 operator if he should continue to do chest compressions, but they instructed him to hang up and deal with the officers on the scene. The officers told Matthew that medics were on their way as they could hear the sirens approaching. Now, while they waited for the medics, officers asked Matthew what the woman's name was, according to the report, and he told them that he wasn't sure what her last name was, but her Instagram said Smith and her first name was Lauren. Medics arrived and began quote-unquote life-saving efforts on Lauren, according to the incident report, but it was too late. Lauren was pronounced dead on the scene at 6.49 a.m. on December 12th, 2021. The responding officer noted in the report that the medics said that Lauren had been dead for an hour or more, which makes you wonder what kind of life-saving efforts were being done on what would have essentially been a corpse at that point. I mean, if she had been dead for an hour or more. Also, police have the training to know whether someone is dead or not. So, and they know how to perform CPR and basic life-saving techniques. And many officers carry defibrillators in their squad cars for that very reason. But The report makes no mention of any life-saving efforts on behalf of the officers who were first to arrive on the scene. Now, after Lauren was pronounced dead, the responding officers called for detectives and for the medical examiner to come to the scene. While officers waited for the detectives and the medical examiner, they located Lauren's phone, her passport, her credit card, and $1,343 in cash. All of Lauren's personal belongings were then taken by police and put into evidence. Lauren's landlord lived on the second floor of the apartment building. And so police made contact with him and he told them that Lauren had been living in the apartment for about a year and that he didn't have an emergency contact for her. He did, however, mention that her mother often came by her apartment to visit. The officers on the scene gave him a complaint incident report and told him to give it to Lauren's mom next time he saw her. He was also given contact information for the detectives that arrived on the scene a little a little later. Now, the medical examiner arrived and examined the body and then arranged for a transport service to take the body to the medical examiner's office. Lauren's body was removed from the apartment around 9.30 a.m. The responding officer indicated in the report that after Lauren's body was removed, that a key that fit the door was found and that they made sure to lock the apartment and make sure it was secure. But they make no mention of any evidence collected for what could have possibly been a crime scene. Now, the other night I was watching a true crime show and one of the detectives they were speaking to said that when a body is found, they treat it like a homicide until they can prove otherwise. But in Lauren's case, the detectives did not treat the discovery of a young, seemingly healthy woman's death as a homicide, and they failed to collect critical evidence from the scene. Meanwhile, Lauren's family had no idea what was going on. Her brother last saw her Saturday night, and Lauren had been pronounced dead in the early morning hours of Sunday, December the 12th. Later in the day, however, Lauren's mom, Chantel, attempted to call her several times and had gotten no answer. 
which was very unusual for Lauren, who was clearly very close with her mom. According to Chantel, Lauren was planning to host the family for Christmas that year, and she had been calling Lauren to talk about it. But after several unanswered calls, her family started to worry. Neither Chantel nor any of Lauren's brothers had spoken to her. On Monday, December 13th, after a day and a half with no word from Lauren, her mom and one of her brothers decided to go over to her apartment to check on her. They arrived at Lauren's apartment around 8 p.m. But when they arrived, instead of finding Lauren, they found a note taped to her door that read, quote, if you're looking for Lauren, call this number. Chantel said that she called the number and went back to her car. And not long after, the landlord came downstairs. Chantel said that she began to panic. Before he even opened his mouth, her motherly instincts told her that something was wrong. The landlord began to tell Chantel what police had told him. He said that something bad had happened and that Lauren was dead. Chantel said she just stood there frozen, in complete disbelief about what he was saying to her. At 23 years old, Lauren was dead, and her mother was finding out a day and a half after she died. The landlord gave Lauren's mother the number for the detective, along with the form that police had given to him to give to her. From the very beginning, though, according to Lauren's family, Bridgeport Police Department was rude and extremely insensitive to them. When they spoke to the detective on the case, they were told that Lauren had been found dead after a date with a man that she met on Bumble. Her brother, Lakeem, said that when he spoke to the detective, he asked them, you know, who is this person that was with his sister the night that she died? But according to him, the detective on the case, Detective Cronin, had already decided that Matthew was a quote-unquote nice guy. He also said that they weren't looking into him anymore, even though it had been less than 48 hours since Lauren's mysterious death and no autopsy had been performed. When the king asked why no one had tried to contact her family, Detective Cronin told him that they didn't need to call her family because they knew who she was and had her passport. However, at that point, they had no idea how she had died, but they had seemingly ruled out who would be their primary suspect. Lauren's family was taken aback by the nonchalant way in which the detective was responding to them. And they were given the impression that police had already made up their mind that Matthew was a nice guy and therefore had nothing to do with what happened to Lauren. When Lakeem asked the detective if he was investigating Lauren's death, he said that he didn't think there was anything to investigate. Now, how could he have possibly drawn that conclusion so quickly? Without collecting evidence, without processing evidence, without an autopsy? Well, Lauren's family wanted to know that too. The detective said that the medical examiner had found no signs of foul play and that Matthew seemed like a really nice guy. And so I guess that's all he needed. I mean, who cares about the actual evidence, right? Detective Cronin, after informing Lauren's family of her death, agreed to meet her family at Lauren's apartment to speak with them further. But Lauren's family waited for 45 minutes, and Detective Cronin never showed up. Lauren's distraught family was at a loss. Their world had just been turned upside down, and the police didn't seem to care at all. In the couple of hours that detectives had spent looking into Lauren's death, they had already judged Lauren and her situation and drawn a conclusion that left Matthew as just a nice guy that was at the wrong place at the wrong time. The problem was, there had not been an investigation. And so any conclusions at that point was premature and irresponsible. After waiting for 45 minutes, Lauren's family left her apartment and they gave Detective Cronin's number to Lauren's dad, Everett, because Everett had questions of his own. But when Everett spoke to Cronin, he too was treated rudely and dismissed. Cronin, according to Everett, told him that he had already spoken to his ex-wife, referring to Chantel, and that if Everett had any questions, he needed to talk to her. And when Everett tried to call Cronin again, 
He said that Cronin asked Everett why he kept calling him and then proceeded to hang up on the grieving father. It was clear to Lauren's family pretty much from the beginning that something was off and they could not figure out why they were being treated this way. They had just found out that Lauren was dead and the police were treating them horribly, like they had done something wrong. When Lauren's family came back to look inside her apartment, they found a disturbing scene and several items that should have been collected by police as part of their initial investigation. The bloodstained sheet on Lauren's bed was still there. They found a plate that had been flipped over, glasses of liquor, a pill, and inside Lauren's trash can, there was a used condom. Now, why would police not have taken this evidence from the scene when Lauren was found? Lauren's family had also been told that Matthew told police that he and Lauren had not had sex, yet a used condom was found in her trash can. Now, in the days after Lauren's death, her family attempted to get information from the Bridgeport Police Department, and they were met with silence. Detective Cronin stopped answering their calls, and they found themselves alone and without answers. And so they decided to hire an attorney to help them get answers. For two long weeks, Lauren's family continued to contact the Bridgeport Police Department, but they were continually dismissed. Finally, after multiple attempts to get some attention to Lauren's case, detectives collected the evidence that was found at the scene by her family, but they did not immediately send the items to the crime lab for testing, and it's not clear if they've been sent to the crime lab yet. For Lauren's family to lose her, Lauren, it's hard enough, but to be completely dismissed and ignored by the local police department added to their trauma. And the only thing that they can conclude was that they were being treated like this because Lauren was a young Black woman, and the police department thought that she was disposable. The man who was with her when she died was a 37-year-old white man, and her family believed that they were protecting him. It seemed like the police department had drawn a conclusion about Lauren and her life based on the fact that Matthew had said that he had met her, you know, just a few days earlier and that she had asked him for $40. But Lauren's family does not believe that she asked him for $40. She had just gotten her nails done and therefore would not have been needing to get them done again. But regardless of how Lauren met Matthew or how long she knew him, that doesn't determine the value of her life and it does not give the police an excuse not to investigate her death. In the very beginning, Lauren's story wasn't picked up by the media. But in the weeks following her death, only those close to Lauren knew exactly what happened to her and how her family was being treated. However, at the end of December, Lauren's story hit social media, and quickly, it went viral. By the beginning of this year, Lauren's story was all over TikTok, Twitter, and Instagram. At that point, people had little information, but they knew the fact that the death of a young Black woman who was found dead in her own apartment after a date was not being investigated, was a very big deal. Videos of Lauren's story quickly gained hundreds of thousands of views, and the public began to join Lauren's family in their demand for justice. The mainstream media then began picking up Lauren's story after seeing the outcry on social media. Soon, CNN, ABC, NBC, CBS... They were all talking about Lauren's story on their national programs because that's what happens when people's voices become too loud to ignore. The mainstream media didn't pick up Lauren's story because they thought it needed attention. They picked it up because people gave it attention and they couldn't ignore it. On January 24th, 2021, over a month after Lauren's death, the medical examiner released the cause of death. According to the medical examiner, Lauren died of acute intoxication due to the combined effects of fentanyl, promethazine, hydroxazine, and alcohol, and they determined that her death was accidental. But for Lauren's family, the medical examiners finally only worsened the mystery because, according to them, Lauren was not a drug user. 
She was not the kind of girl that would use hard drugs. And so finding those drugs in her system for them meant that someone had to have given them to her without her knowledge. There was never any mention of any drugs or drug paraphernalia found in Lauren's apartment. And all of Lauren's family and friends denied that she used drugs. Lauren's family would not accept the ruling of accident in Lauren's death. And they continued to demand a full and thorough investigation into Lauren's death. Now, in a twist, the same day that the medical examiner released the results of the autopsy, the mayor of Bridgeport announced the suspension of Detective Cronin, along with another detective that had been assigned to the case. He also announced that they were launching an internal investigation into their conduct and potential mishandling of Lauren's death investigation. In a statement, the mayor said that sensitivity and care is of utmost importance when working with the family of a victim. There is no tolerance for anything less than respect and sensitivity for family members and their loss. The next day, the DEA announced that they would join the Bridgeport Police Department in launching an investigation into Lauren's death. Due to the fentanyl found in her system, the DEA said that they would do an investigation into how the drugs got into Lauren's system and into who gave them to her. For Lauren's family, however, the damage had been done, and they believed that key pieces of evidence had been lost. They had been re-victimized by the Bridgeport Police Department, and they were not just going to go away quietly. In January, the attorney for the family filed a legal notice informing the city of Bridgeport that Lauren's family would be filing a lawsuit regarding the way in which Lauren's death investigation was handled. Matthew LaFountain scrubbed his social media and hired an attorney. He has yet to make any public statements himself choosing to speak only through his attorney. Matthew, of course, denies any wrongdoing and says that police are not looking at him in connection with Lauren's death. And we're not sure whether or not that has changed in recent weeks. Lauren's family lost all confidence in the Bridgeport Police Department, and they set up a GoFundMe to raise money to hire a private investigator. They also want an independent autopsy performed. And it's not clear where the family is in either of those processes. But to date, the GoFundMe has raised over $95,000 of its $100,000 goal. At this point, it's hard to determine where everything stands in the investigation. But we do know that Matthew LaFountain has not been named a suspect or a person of interest. Hopefully, an actual investigation is taking place. But... We'll have to wait and see what happens and what police find out. In early March of this year, the Connecticut legislator proposed a new bill that would require police departments to notify next of kin within 24 hours of death. The bill was a direct response to the deaths of Lauren Smith Fields and another Connecticut woman named Brenda Rawls. Brenda was found dead the same day that Lauren was, and her family was also not notified of her death. They found out two days later when they searched for Brenda, only to find out that she was at the coroner's. No one had contacted them either. There are still many unanswered questions about what happened to Lauren on the night of December the 11th. But I think it's pretty clear that the Bridgeport Police Department failed Lauren's family. If her family had not been determined to get answers, and if people on social media hadn't latched on to Lauren's story, we may know even less than we know now. As part of the pending lawsuit, Lauren's family attorney says that he has received multiple calls from people saying that Matthew LaFountain and Detective Cronin knew each other. And if that's true, it could explain a lot. For Lauren's family, they're determined to keep fighting, and they don't want anybody to forget about Lauren. She was their daughter, their sister, and their friend. And at 23 years old, she should not have died with no explanation. If the Bridgeport Police Department had handled this as a homicide investigation from day one, preserved the scene, collected evidence, perhaps we wouldn't be where we are now. I know I will continue to follow the story and keep you all updated as we learn new information about Lauren's case. 
But this story proves how much we as the public can demand accountability from those who are here to protect and to serve. And it holds a mirror up to the mainstream media, who would not have reported on this story had it not been for the public outcry. I pray that Lauren's family receives the answers that they need. And if someone caused Lauren's death, then they deserve for that person to be held accountable. Lauren Smith Fields was 23 years old when she died on December 12th, 2021. She was not only beautiful on the outside, but everyone who knew and loved Lauren said she was even more beautiful on the inside. Do not forget about Lauren or her family. They still need you. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. We will be back next week with a brand new story. Join us on Patreon for exclusive mini-sodes and ad-free episodes. As always, like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Black Girl Gone Podcast. Listening on Apple Podcasts? Show your support for the show by leaving a review and a five-star rating.